starting the conversation. Welcome to the SPSJ podcast. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the SBSJ podcast. Today, we have an interview. Um, Andy interviewed Rich Johnson, who is the national leader for New Wine England. And I am joined today by some newbies who uh, are going to introduce themselves. I'm Grace. For those who've listened to the podcast before, you know me already. But I'm joined today by Mary and Graham. And I wonder if you could please, uh, maybe we'll start with Mary. Could you introduce yourself and could you let us know if you have any experience of new wine? Because I don't, so I have nothing to contribute to this. But if you could tell us a bit about yourself and what experience you have of new new wine, then that would be fantastic. Hi, everyone. Yes, my name's Mary. I've been part of St. James's and St. Peter's for over 30 years. I uh, have had uh, a lot of time working with young people and as a family, which is with my husband and two children, we have been to New Wine, I think, four or five times as a whole family. Uh, great experience to go with as a family. Lots of amazing teaching for adults. The children work is set up in a way that you can have time as an adult to hear and be fed whilst the children are having their own teaching groups. And, yeah, we found it a really refreshing brilliant time together as a family to be yeah, growing closer to God. That's my experience. It's over to you, Graham. Hi, yeah, I'm Graham. I've been an equally member of uh, attendee at St. James St. Peter's for the last 30 plus years. Um, been to, to uh, I'm married with four grow, now grown up children and they've all kind of been to New Wine uh, with us as a family, been some, um, multiple times, uh sometimes as a smaller group sometimes as a bigger group with with a part of the family of the of the church and my take on you is it's such a brilliant experience to remove yourself from uh the jobs to the inevitable jobs to do list that there is in life um to be away with kind of just a, a wider group of christian people who are just wanting to experience god uh, learn more from God, hear more from God. Um, the times when I've been in the prayer tent, I've just been astonishing. There's a 24 hour prayer tent for those that don't know. No, uh, you can go the whole whole time you're there, anytime, two o'clock in the morning, doesn't matter. And the sense of God in that place is just amazing. Um, so yeah, no, just a brilliant time of worship, and 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 a glimpse for me. It's always been a bit of a glimpse of how i think heaven's going to be there's just that ease that people are at there's that unity of spirit and purpose and and just no aggro just you know you go walk walk into high town or something you can see people have aggro but you can just see you know people are a bit antsy it's just not there it's just amazing so yeah that's been my experience from you are brilliant thank you so much that sounds idyllic really maybe i'll need to uh to check it out and go along um mary graham thank you so much for being here today to to chat with me and uh, and of course producer heather who is lurking in the background as always <laughs> um i think without further ado then we'll listen to the to the episode and then we'll uh, meet back and and have a chat about what rich has to say Well, I'm delighted uh, to have Rich Johnson uh, joining us today for our SBSJ podcast. Uh, Rich is a vicar over in All Saints and St. Helens in the central Worcester. Uh, but you also have another role, don't you, Rich, which you uh, recently inherited? Would you like I to do. tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So I'm um, officially the national leader of New Wine England. Uh, actually, in practice, do it with Kath, my wife as well, and a team of others. But um, I have that title um, and some of you all have heard of New Wine, others won't. It's a family of churches and a network of leaders uh, here in the, in England. Um, but actually, the New Wine family is global. So there are 
new wine networks in other countries as well. So, yeah, I've been doing that just over a year and I love it. Fantastic. And, and uh, so how long has new wine been going? So it's already global. Uh, yeah. So new it wine, start? it started 1989, so 35 years ago. Um, and yeah, it's spread um, all around the world. So in 14 countries now. What's really interesting is all all the different other bits of the new wine global family essentially all have a common origin story, which is people connected into new wine England as part of their kind of pursuing of the things of God and thought, hey, we could do this back in Sweden or Italy or Brazil or all these different countries. And um, because it's a very simple model, it's like we just gather church leaders and their churches around uh two things uh commitment to word and spirit ministry um and a conviction that it's in and through the local church that god changes nations and so our kind of global strap line if you like is local churches changing nations um and i think what's great is any church leader any church that wants to lean into that can and so i was chatting recently to one of the bishops in the church of england who he said the thing about New Wine England is that like you have the biggest reach. So we actually are officially apparently one of the biggest networks. But what I, I love about it is it's not lots of big churches. Um he was saying you've you've got new wine churches in every context, in every county. So uh city centre churches, suburban churches, rural churches, urban uh context churches. Lots of them are Anglican, but a whole load aren't. So um it's this glorious kind of family of people who who have a shared conviction and DNA, but actually all sorts of different experiences and stories. Um, and I was with you guys recently over in at Craven Arms, and yeah. uh, I absolutely loved it. And I, I was in this room thinking, this is so glorious. This is what New Wine's all about. And then about two weeks later, I found myself in Cape Town in South Africa with the New Wine South Africa guys. And it's the, almost an identical kind of sense and feeling. And uh, it's a really precious thing. Yeah, I remember you coming over. It was uh, it was crazy, wasn't it? We was in a Methodist hall in a kind of small rural little village, uh, and yet what's what's it, 60, 70, 80 something people? Yeah, together. I think it was near like, near ninety seats and yeah, 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 crazy. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. totally. And what's brilliant about what um, you know we do, and it's not like new wine isn't the you know we're not the ones who have to sort of. It's not like copyrighted. All we're trying to do is keep it simple like we see in the book of acts which is the holy spirit was poured out on all people and um, so we are the church and we're called to be people of the word and the spirit we go in the name of jesus and in the power of his spirit and um, and so we're what we're trying to do when we when we go to those sorts of gatherings is simply say hey look you're in on this like you're you're part of what god wants to do in in history through your generation in your context and um i think sometimes we can think it's going to be the bigger church in the bigger community down the road that gets to kind of do the work and it's like no no it's actually the some of the most brilliant things i've been to have been in places like craven arms actually you know no one's ever heard of craven arms <laughs> um but actually hungry christians gathering together saying god we want to see you pour out your spirit in these days on our community and in in our churches and on the people who call this home and like that is the kingdom of god isn't it right there you know and that's why the, it's about cheering on the local church and most of the leaders in our network are in places I've never heard of, you know, leading churches I've never heard of, and they are unsung heroes. And they're amazing, you know, because they've just got a vision for the kingdom of God in their community, that bit of the, the country that they've been entrusted with. And we just want to cheer them on, resource them, bless them. Um, it's tough. Local church leadership is tough. Um, following Jesus in this cultural moment is tough. We need to cheer each other on and uh, do it together. Absolutely. I, I got to go to uh, a church leaders conference in Dallas when I was on sabbatical and they were saying a very similar thing, actually. They were just really trying to praise all of these church leaders that were in that building. And yes, there are some mega churches in America. Of course, there are. But actually, a lot of them are in churches of 10, 50, 100 people, just like we are in England. And they just were acknowledging the same. It's hard. We know yeah. it's hard. But you guys are the heroes. Keep going. Yeah, yeah totally. Space. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think you know one of the things that I'm passionate about is, and and you totally have this heart, Andy, um, which I love, is that the job of the church leader is to equip the saints for the work of service. Like you know Ephesians four, it's like we we are all on the team, and yeah. actually, but most people are called to outwork their faith 
as the church in the world. Um, so wherever you have influence, which is your neighborhood, your street, your school, your university, your workplace, your family, you know, and actually we all need to help make church life happen, don't we? Right. But actually I, I'm like, our faith has to be a kingdom centered faith, not a church centered one. Does that make sense? Like we can, yeah, we, can we can do loads of church and just get busy doing church and think, great, we're doing lots of stuff, but actually have no impact on our local community a um, but also it not be transformative for us either because it's meant to be joined up you know and um people often say you know ask me questions like so how big's your church now and uh, <laughs> and, and and i i'm i'm pretty cheeky normally i go yeah we're about um four to five thousand <laughs> and as, as in like stupid question a i don't actually know the question the answer to your question because we're not very good at counting things but actually it's the wrong question because for me it's like so the metric we have in worcester is like would worcester miss us if we closed down overnight yeah like if if suddenly people woke up and all saints worcester has disappeared would would anyone notice and uh, and you can critique that for sure but it's a helpful thing of like gosh we can do all sorts of christian things forever with each other but does it make any difference um, tangibly in our lives and the lives of people around us? And I think we'd say now, yeah, they would. We run Worcester Food Bank, for example, which is a huge project. And we've got all sorts of other things we do with other people. But um, yeah. And so local church, every local church leader I know went into local church leadership because they want to equip the saints for the work of service, you know, and they don't want to be the ones doing it for you. They want to do it you know, with you and free you. And that, I know that's totally your heart for what you guys are doing in Hereford, which I love. And, and it feels, doesn't it, though, that we can make church so complicated. We mm. both know it can be quite an animal of an organisation to run if we're not careful. Totally. <laughs> and, and and how do we keep it, yeah, to that kind of really basic level of actually this is about um, being ultimately, as you say, just equipping the saints is what church is meant to be. Yeah. <laughs> it's meant to be that place where that happens. Yeah. Um, I mean, so in your kind of like, as you go around the country, uh, the world, sometimes visiting places, what what is your sense of actually what is in this changing era that we're obviously living through at the moment? Mm. What is God saying to the church with all those challenges that are out there that we're facing? Yeah, yeah. great question. Um, and I love answering it. It's my, kind of the thing that motivates me. I, I think there's a few things I'd say, Andy. The, the, the first is that, well, so, so you know, it's increasingly clear that we are, you know, in terms of socio-culturally, we are in a in a shift now, cultural shift from from a secular age um, to some sort of post-secular era, um, and it, and we don't know how far into that transition we are because cultural transitions take decades, if not centuries. Yeah. So it feels disorientating and confusing, but we intuitively know that the world hasn't gone back to normal as it as in whatever normal was pre-COVID which on one level is hard and on another level I find quite exciting because it wasn't great before. Um, let's remember, you know. <laughs> um, and so so on one level, that is really disorientating and discouraging and, and confusing for those of us who follow Jesus because it's like, oh gosh, all our metrics and bearings have gone. And it seems like the world around us is less interested in God, faith, et cetera, than ever before. And yet at the same time, we're also seeing in that cultural moment uh what, what Justin Briley is calling you know, the surprising rebirth of faith in, uh, in the intellectual space. And because I think what happens in cultural change is people begin to ask questions individually and, and as, a, as a society. And it's often the intellectual voices that are asking those questions on behalf of their people. So so Tom Holland, for example, uh, the historian, not, not Spider-Man, um, he's, his book Dominion, phenomenal book, he basically makes the case that... Um, contrary to what we might think the foundations of english society the uk is not greco-roman it's actually judeo-christian and so the rejection of our judeo-christian heritage foundations values is deeply problematic for us because we're actually undoing the very thing that our culture and society is founded on which i think is a profound insight and i think it's absolutely right so so i say that because i think what god is saying to the church is this moment <laughs> which feels so hard and contested and confusing is your moment church because we have answers to the questions that people are asking we have a better story the kingdom of god the biblical worldview is like is just is 
offers something that is transcendent of any cultural moment. Um, and people want to hear it right now and need to hear it. And so um, this this sort of in between, you know, one world and another is actually where the church thrives. You know, like we are in between us, right? We're kingdom of God now, not yet people. And so I think what God is wanting to do is 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 encourage and build a confidence in His church that that in this cultural moment, actually, He's going to do amazing things through us for people. Um, but and we were talking talking about this just before we hit record, right? I, I but I think what He's actually doing first is wanting to sort the church out. Yeah. Um, because I think uh, for Him to, my, I mean, my language is, you know, I think He wants to send us as a as a creative, courageous compassionate church into this cultural moment um and if you know church history you know uh, that's what early church was it was this kind of time of huge cultural uncertainty and the church was potent in the mix of that right but it was potent in the mix of it because it was in a really good place and actually i think what god is doing first is wanting to is wanting us to become a, a holier healthier and more humble church again and that actually requires leaders who are like that. So our recent leadership conference, which you were at, you know, holy, healthy, humble leadership is is key because actually what the world doesn't need from us and actually what we don't need as each as the church is, is more programs, great ideas, initiatives. Like what we need is, is to be more on fire for God, holier, you know, uh, pursuing God, healthier in terms of our spirituality our and our integrated health you know like physical health relational health collectively as a church you know the churches that god uses the most are the ones that have really learned how to to practice those one another's you know in the new testament it's like love one another bear with one another forgive one another so there's a whole list of one another's like healthy churches they don't avoid they don't avoid conflict they deal with it really well they they pursue unity they 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 learn to live in with grace towards one another and um and there's a humility in that i think of like actually gosh we, you know we we need god we need each other we haven't got all the answers but but a humble confidence in jesus it's like um and actually that's really compelling that's really attractive um we had we've had a number of people just last few weeks even just walking off the street um gen- like literally walking past walking off the street walking and going oh, what is what is this this gathering, it's like, it's so countercultural. It's so otherworldly um, in a beautiful way that, and and they don't have, a, they've got no no reference point. And so we, and, and so they're joining us. It's like we can we can trust that when we pursue the things of God, um, and pursue God Himself rather than do things for Him. And so that's a really long answer to your question, but I, I think no, it's a really great. exciting moment in which we need to we need to let the Spirit do His deep work in us so that he can do a deep work through us no that's a great answer thank you and and i i would agree i mean people was use language won't they like this feels different you know they can almost sense there's a, a different motivation or a different um that there's something they can't quite articulate but yeah. they can see it they can feel it uh, and then it brings them doesn't it to ask questions yeah absolutely um and, but the thing that's compelling is when you meet people um whose lives clearly match what they believe. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I remember when I, so I came to faith at the end of my time at university and, and that's so 25 years ago. And I remember that the conversations were like, is it true? You're like, yeah. um, and I, all the people that I speak to in our context who are exploring faith, they're not asking that question. I mean, they, they are asking that question, but the primary question actually is, is a plausibility question. Like, does this actually work? Does this it, does this make any difference? Like, tell me, like, show me what this means in practice. And so, actually, we can trust that if we're faithful and obedient to God, taking seriously the call to sacrificial, generous kingdom living, and you know, dependent on the Spirit, owning our stuff, letting Him heal us, confessing our sin, and coming alive in the things of God, that 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 lives gets lived out in the way we do community, the way we parent, the way we uh, do life together as a church. You know, one of our uh, young adults who's been kicking around for a while, not not a Christian, she she just can't get her head around the community. She's like, I've like, I don't have this. 
you know she said most of my connections are digital this this is a family of people who like want to be together you know it's like and it but it's the overflow of of a hunger and a pursuit of god right when it's not a program thing it's not like we're just gonna have loads of church lunches and make everyone hang out with each other it's like that's, that's the last thing anyone needs like it's people out working a sense of what it is and and so um uh, the applause you know does it work is there something in this it needs to be seen and um and on one level that i find that a pressure because you think oh gosh like where i'm at with god is is witness but we know that's true but it takes a whole load of pressure off us on another level which is like jesus is building the church jesus is the one that saves people what he's looking for i think is a white hot potent passionate community of people who bear his name and live in the power of his spirit. And he does the heavy lifting through us. So I think actually it feels like it could be a whole lot more fun. Um, <laughs> church has become a bit serious, a bit boring. Yeah. And you can organize the life out of a church, you know, like I, you've got to have some organization. I get that, but like it should feel a bit messy because it's a family, you know? And um, yes, yeah, so I'm excited in these days, as you probably can tell. I think the best days are ahead of us. I think it's a really exciting time to be a Christian. Hard, but I think we're going to see something happen. I think there's a move of the Spirit coming in these days that we're praying for, leaning in for, and an awakening that's going to happen. But it's going to come through us, us pursuing holy, healthy, humble Christianity for ourselves. And and then God, you know, is it John Wesley that said, you know, people, people, you don't need to gather people. You just set yourself on fire and I'm, I'm murdering the quote now, but like people come to people just are drawn to the fire. Yeah. So let's set ourselves on fire for God and he does the rest. Well, that seems a fantastic place to end rich. Thank you so much. There's so much there. I'm sure that is uh, going to get people talking and get people thinking and hopefully Great. excited as well. Yeah. Uh, that call for the church to be holy, healthy and humble and for, it, this is the time to be confident and courageous in our faith and encourage okay. each other in that. So, um, yeah. so thank you. And uh, yeah, I look forward to hopefully seeing you again soon. Yeah, brilliant. Have a great conversation, guys. Okay, so there was so much in that interview. I'm just checking my notes now and, and deciding where to begin. I feel like there was... Uh, there was just loads and loads to to reflect on there and um Andy asked that question you know what is what is God saying to the church and and Rich was reflecting on on what he thinks um what he thinks God wants to see the church doing and I was really struck by um I'd never heard that that sort of tagline I suppose of new wine before about um God changing the nations through local churches um and that really struck me. I I think because we live in a very rural place in Herefordshire, and there are a lot of very local, very small churches around our county um, that perhaps are struggling and perhaps feel like they they can't do much to change the nation around them. I don't know, Mary Graham, what what were your thoughts on that that idea of local church being the place where change happens? I like, I, go on, Mary. I like the part where he said it's not always about being Christians in a bigger church. It's about being in your church. And if you are hungry as a Christian, it doesn't matter if you're in one of the big churches in the, the main town or if you're in the village church. It's about your hunger and therefore your hunger will be God's spirit pouring out on you and the community that you're in. And I think hopefully that, and then they talked about what's going on in Herefordshire, particularly up in the Craven Arms area, where I know, because I've been to some of the local meetings about New Wine, just how amazing things are happening up there. And they started in very small churches, but the people are hungry and they have, that they are obviously being really led by God's spirit. And I found that really encouraging that it's not about how big, but it's about your personal hunger and then meeting with other people. What struck me in a similar way, what struck me about um, Rich said there was uh, something that um, Dee's grandmother said to her. Uh, they they lived in a small ruralish community and she said, you've got to blossom where you're planted. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, I, I, I was called to the rural world um, in, in my work 
um and uh, and i've tried to blossom in that it, it's it, it's a, it's a rural world um and and i think it's same absolutely true for smaller churches you know you're not going to have the 10,000 mega church experience in in the middle of the golden valley in herefordshire it's just not <laughs> there's not the population uh but you can still blossom where you planted and that that applies in a in a in a small village that applies in a in a in a, in a, in a a small city like Hereford is, um, uh, and in a local church environment, wherever you are. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Go on, Heather. Go on, yeah, also, it, he said it's about acknowledging that it's hard as well. And I think whatever context you're in, however, say, big your church is, or small, like, it's still difficult. We all have different challenges. But acknowledging that we're all on the same team, to use his words, it's not just the leader of a church that has responsibility for this, for this, having this kingdom focus, as it were. Whatever size church you're a part of, we're all on this team and we all have a call to make disciples and to share our faith with one another um, wherever we have influence. As Graham said, whether that's in the workplace, whether that's as part of a sports team, as whether that's part of a, a mum and toddler group, whatever it is, we all have influence, but it's how do we use that? Do we have that kingdom focus when we're in those places? Mm. I like that phrase, kingdom focus, not church focus. Mm. And I think he said at one point, we don't need more programs and initiatives. And I think that can be a challenge when you maybe are in a bigger church because the instinct is to do more and to get more programs and more initiatives but often those things are inward looking anyway I know in the village that I live in there's a, a very small parish church and it has a very very small um, sort of Sunday congregation but actually what that church does is it serves its community really well on occasions like you know funerals weddings harvest christmas time it, it gets really full and it also is very outward looking it's a um it's open 24 hours a day it's on this sort of um walking path where walkers can come in and make themselves a cup of tea and reflect and actually it serves the community in ways beyond just a church service on a sunday and if you try and measure it just by who goes on a sunday morning then actually it doesn't look that great but what what they are doing is much, much more than that and serving the community in ways that, that maybe people don't recognize. So it, it did make me think about that. Can I just bring that up? I think that's absolutely fantastic what they're doing. That's a really lovely way of using the church. And I just want to come back to what the bit we were saying about um, it being culturally tough and we need to encourage and support each other. And he, he quoted Ephesians 4 about working at our faith wherever you are. And that was something, that, going back to New Wine, that spoke to me very directly. When I went and Theo, our son, who is now in his 20s, I was, I was on maternity leave and I wasn't sure whether I should go back to work or whether this was my time to be at home, having got an older child as well. And I went to a, a talk at New Wine by an amazing lady called Mary Pitches, who talked about your your faith is wherever you are, your your church your spirit um sorry sharing your faith can be anywhere and and it was very clear and she said and that starts with home you start at home and and it clearly spoke to me that I wasn't to go back to work and that actually where I shared my faith was at the school gate so it that for me was encouraging other people who maybe you know wanted to just ask questions and and I never knew how how I came across to people in terms of my faith but I had a, quite a few mums come and say, there's something different about you. Can I talk to you about something? So, you know, that that relating back to new wine was a simple thing. And yeah, how do we encourage people? That, that That's how I felt. I think it's coming back to the point that Rich made about the, the church offers something completely transcendent mm. to any cultural moment that we have. And that's why when it's always been relevant, whatever the cultural shift is the church and the gospel is always relevant, but it's how we kind of pitch it and how we speak into the different situations that we find ourselves in, because people are always asking questions. Everyone is always searching for something, whether they realize it or not. 
everyone is searching for something, always asking questions. And therefore, the gospel people need to and also want to hear it in a sense Mm. at the moment, but they don't necessarily realise it at the time. And that's because what the church offers, what we offer as church, what the gospel offers is completely transcendent. And I think that really hit home that when we think, oh, it's not relevant or we need to be more relevant, the gospel is already relevant. We need to get in touch back with with the gospel. And I think it links with with his points of being healthy, holy and humble, doesn't it? Grace. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting that you're saying about how there are always these questions out there. And I think that's absolutely true. But I liked what he said about we are in an in-between moment Mm. right now. You know, it feels like it's quite a difficult time to be a Christian, perhaps, because, you know, people often, you know, sociologists will talk about the UK being in a post-Christian society. You know, we've we've done that. (laughs) We did the Christian thing and now we've moved on. We're more enlightened. Um, And so that can be harder in some ways than talking to someone who's never heard of Jesus or never heard about Christianity. Um, But he was saying in those in-between times, that's when those questions come up even more because you're trying to remove what has been a foundation for a very long time, but haven't got anything to replace it with yet. And so people are asking those questions afresh and it may be that actually the answers are in Christianity and and people need to sort of rediscover it and, and discover it anew rather than just inheriting it and accepting what's always been handed down so it's not necessarily a bad thing it can be quite an exciting thing um but I liked you know you've already mentioned his sort of three h's I suppose (laughs) um and he said that God wants to sort the church out first before we go out and try and solve everybody's problems that we've got some kind of inner work to be doing and for God to do in us and he said that the church should be holier healthier and more humble um what what did people make of those? Did anything stand out to you particularly? Certainly, from my my perspective, it uh, what what struck a chord when when just just breaking those down: holy, healthy, and humble. Holy for me, if you look back through the centuries, the times of uh, big spiritual awakenings have been when the church has got back to holiness, really holy and on its knees and and there is that there's the continued call through down through the ages old testament jesus paul right through the right through the bible be holy be holy and uh, and so yeah that call that call doesn't change in so much in so much and actually we just need to keep looking at our own lives and say actually am i being holy am i being holy enough and not holier than thou but holy yeah um, but I, I think that's, that's, that's the holy for me. The, the healthy, I think, is quite interesting because we've got a society that lo- actually looks like it's getting sicker, health physically, mentally, probably spiritually. Although people won't always know, recognize, and understand that them, in themselves. Mm. And actually, I think society senses something's not quite right, but doesn't know what what the answer is. And I actually. Uh, there's lots of lots of good stuff through Christian experience and from what Jesus said about all those three things. Um, so, yeah, so uh, absolutely healthy. And we can do that in the church. We can encourage that. We can encourage physical health. We can encourage spiritual health. We can encourage mental health. And and I've always taken the view for myself and tried to encourage my family. These things are, are actually interrelated. If I'm not mentally healthy, I probably won't be physically healthy and I probably won't be spiritually healthy either because I'm just feeling yuck. Um, and actually, if you can work through all of those things uh, and p- apply different things to deal with that health, those health issues, you you kind of go the other way. Hmm. I wonder whether as a church as well, because how often do you associate church with physical health? I don't think you do. You associate it with going into a building on a Sunday and sitting down and that, that you know, not necessarily being out and about and doing active things and, and looking after yourself. And I wonder if historically as a church with a big C, um, we've had the idea that yes, we do have answers that will help society, 
they need to accept Jesus as their savior first, come on in and then we'll tell you what the answers are. And we'll, yeah. we'll help you, you know, look at all those other aspects of life. But and our outreach has been much more just thinking about, right, well, we want to help someone's soul. But actually, we can be reaching out in all areas. We can be reaching out to help people with their physical health and their mental health and their emotional health, all areas of well-being, even before they come into church and and make any kind of decision about what they believe doctrinally because we are church and we are the hands of of jesus and and that's that's what we're called to do um so i really i I liked what he was saying about that he said he was talking about being holy being about when we pursue god not when we do things for god and i think often we try and do things for god before we have actually found out where is god working and what's god doing already we kind of think we know what needs doing and we just go out and do it without much reflection maybe I also like the part where he talked about um, the kingdom of God. We've got to build and encourage confidence and therefore we've got to sort the church out first before we can go out and, you know, be creative, courageous, compassionate people. And I, that that spoke to me clearly that, you know, we, we as the church first have to sort ourselves out because that, that otherwise we're not effective in those areas. And therefore we would then become holier, healthier, humble and that's what we're, we're we're talking about, isn't it? Today, that's what we're striving to be. Yeah, I, I think on that that I've, as I said, I've not been to New Wine before, but I've been to various Christian conferences and Christian festivals, and especially as a young person, I had that sense of being on fire for God, uh, coming out of that and feel really feeling that that sense of I'm being sent out, I'm being called, I'm being sent out to go into the world and to share my faith with others. And you almost, you know, you're on, you're on that spiritual high, as it were, when you go to those kind of things for any listeners that maybe resonate with that um, as, as these guys do too, but we kind of lose it. I think during the, well, what the church of England would call ordinary time, um, what anyone else would say is just doing a- everyday life. We can lose that sense of that. And I think we need to recapture that as church. And that's not a, sen- a-, a case of the-, the local church needs to be throwing festivals and events left, right and centre. But how can we, Rich said, we need to be more on fire for God. So how can we do that and encourage that within our local church that then gives that sense of, wow, like, I've got a job here and I feel really on fire for God and I'm going to go in like a dragon, breathe this fire on those I meet in the places that I'm in. Um, I don't think that's a real challenge for church leaders, um, but also the wider church as well. But a massive thing for church leaders that we should really be praying for our church leaders and how they plan for that and how they create that kind of culture within the church today. Going rewinding the conversation a bit but it's linked to holy healthy and humble um rich was speaking about uh, how people are going to into the church and, and sort of seeking authenticity because i think well what's interesting is the digital world has developed is that uh we, we're constantly trying to sift through the fake news is this true is this really true what what what, and what i'm seeing online is it true and how does it compare with reality and and I think when people come into a, a a healthy, holy, humble church with a healthy, humble group of kingdom people, they kind of see that authenticity, and they, that's that is really attractive. Uh, I, I completely agree with what Rich was saying about that. Um, so actually, again, going back to the humble, you know, here, here are these Christians saying one thing, but actually, are they doing another? Um, he, he, actually, do they care about people's well-being? You're absolutely right, and. And and are they being proud and holy than now about it, or are they saying, "Come on, we need to, we need to, we need to get here. Come on, guys." So, um, uh, and I think in that in that search for authenticity and people finding it, then then that's just a natural way into yeah. Actually, no, we believe this thing is true. It's changed my, changed our lives, and and this is why we do what we do as as kingdom people. 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We um we try to keep these uh, these reflective bits fairly brief, and I know for for the sake of Heather's editing afterwards, um, I I I would encourage people, anyone who's listening, you know, this this sort of the three H's: the holier, healthier, and more humble. It applies to churches, it applies to individuals, it applies to families, friendship groups, you know, whatever context you're listening in. Um, I think there is something in that for you to be thinking about, you know, how can you be developing in that? How can you be, be seeking to be holier, healthier and more humble in your um, in your Christian life, in your community, um, whatever that looks like? Um, Graham, Mary, Heather, have you got anything else that stood out to you that you want to to share before we close? Heather? I just think a, a big thing is practically applying that is when he talks about the practicing the one another's. Mm. I don't know if that stood out to any of, of the rest of you about love one another, care for one another, all of those things that are kind of countercultural but they're the practical outworkings of being holier, of being healthier, of being humbler and creating a more holy, healthy and humble community in which you live um, is a big challenge. Maybe that's a challenge to take away and to challenge our listeners with to practice the one another's, as it were, um, in a, in the Bible that Jesus talk, calls us to, to do. One other thought I had just following on from that was... Um... He talked about conflict and we don't like conflict as in verbal conflict or disagreeing with people. It's becoming really, a, I think, a big issue, isn't it, in today's world where if you don't agree with somebody, you're the one given a horrible label because you, you, we need to be able to disagree healthily. And that he talked about that, didn't he? And, he, and it, talking about it with unity and grace and humility and humble confidence in Jesus. And that really spoke to me that we can have conflict, we can have disagreement, but it's how we deal with it that we deal with it appropriately not not in a aggressive manner that's also something that stood out yeah absolutely absolutely i can i just say in terms of a practical thing that, that that's going on at the moment we've and um, post covid as as a, as a church we've, we've been developing more house groups and i know grace and and, and tom you're kind of instrumental in putting some of those together our, our part of that in terms of our, our house group is growing it, it just been brilliant in terms of some of this stuff about holy healthy and humble um we've been gathering just for meals first off just just having meal together um consistently weekly consistently uh and just that's such a great time it's kind of like just doing life together really um and that then feeds through into into discussion and prayer and study and and just talking through the the, the challenges that we face in our day-to-day -day lives the, the the dealing with the the difficult stuff that that rich talked about as well because uh, because of the culture that we're in but actually it's been such a blessing such a blessing but and we know we we, we know we need to continue continue doing that and continue looking outward as well and encouraging others in um and we might need to split at some point but uh, yeah uh, in terms of because the group's actually getting too big to fill the space <laughs> That's always good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> always good to hear that groups flourishing like that. And that's a, a fantastic example of, like you say, doing life together and implementing these things. Because, you know, he talks about local church, but actually local churches themselves are made up of smaller groups or can be made up of smaller groups and house groups and church looks different in lots of different places. Some churches are literally just meeting in people's homes. You know, they, they don't have their own their own building or anything like that so there's so many different ways that that we can be working this out thank you wonderful so I think we'll probably end it there hopefully listener you, you have got something to to chew over a conversation to start or or just something to reflect on on your own um thank you Graham Mary and Heather for joining me today and uh we hope that you will join us again next time goodbye Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope this episode has got you thinking and please share this conversation with someone as we continue to learn and grow together. We look forward to you joining us again next time.